have some announcements. Throughout the month of July, there will be a display of EPPC photos and artifacts for the identification purposes in the library relating to the celebration of our 70th anniversary on September 29th. Be sure to stop by and take a look at the display. We would appreciate your input. On Sunday, August 4th, after worship, the congregation is invited to help assemble the bags and write notes of encouragement for these families. We are collecting individually packaged granola bar bars, goldfish crackers, cookies, raisins, pretzels, applesauce, single serving package packages of oatmeal or other cereal and mini muffins. Are there any other announcements? I have a brief announcement. I want to welcome and thank Grace Hurd for being here as our musician this morning. So Grace is filling in as Therese is on vacation. So we are grateful that we have the musician to lead us in worship. Anyone else have any announcements? Anything else? Please stand for the call to worship. Lord, we come to worship you, seeking Sabbath rest, to listen for your teachings, and to seek rest for our souls. Give thanks to God. Bless God's name, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever, and God's faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Holy God, we are eager to praise you. Bless us with joy, <clears throat> with joy, safety, good health, and love every day. Be present with us as we are, as we follow Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By the grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. I declare to you that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We believe you God, God sent his Son to proclaim release to those who are bound to announce that God's promised kingdom is at hand, to urge everyone to repent and believe the good news. The Lord is moving toward the time when the glorious liberty of the children of God will be manifest throughout the whole creation. We testify God is at work here and now when people obey Christ's commission to witness to him and make disciples of all nations when they spread the good news by their words 
and embody it in their lives. We believe that God sends us to tell all nations that Christ calls everyone to repentance, faith, and obedience. Amen. Please be seated. morning as we continue to lift our voices in praise and prayer. We are going to use the words of King David from Psalm 89. If you've been joining us for our morning Bible study the last several weeks, we've been focusing on King David and the story of his reign found in 2 Samuel. So we would love to have you join us if that's of interest to you. But during King David's reign, he not only had songs of praise and poetry and liturgy, but songs of lament and history. And the book of Psalms now helps us retell and relive and announce with those same words from that time so long ago. So let us responsibly lift up the words of Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. O Lord God Almighty, who is like you, you are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. For the past several weeks, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark, so you may be aware that the lectionary provides a guide to us to hopefully read through all of Scripture over three years, but it's infrequent that we read all four readings every day, every day of the year for three years. If we did, that'd be impressive to get through all of scripture. But because of that intermittent reading and our availability, we on Sunday mornings and find ourselves reading what many other congregations are looking to in the morning. So I would expect if you talk to fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in our community at large who worship in other faith traditions within the Christian family tree, that the Lutherans, the Episcopalians, the Methodists, and other Presbyterians are also looking at the Gospel of Mark during the month of July. So we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, and if you want to follow along, it's on page 996 and 997 in our Pew Bible. But as we turn to our continued explanation of the early days of discipleship with Jesus, please first join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we are grateful. We are grateful that there are four gospel accounts of your amazing ministry here on earth among us in the person of Jesus Christ. We are grateful that your Holy Spirit has kept your word alive and active so that we now, several generations later, can recount and retell and learn from the amazing witness of your faithfulness to all people. We thank you, Lord, for stories of abundance, for miracles, for accounts of your teaching and preaching, for the eagerness of people of all backgrounds to seek you out. We ask now that with the presence of your Holy Spirit in this place, that those who are worshiping in the sanctuary with us and those who worship from home may learn from you, may continue our discipleship journey together, and may find in this account from the gospel a reason to celebrate and testify to how you are at work in our own lives, our church, and our world to this day. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. So this morning we're in the Gospel of Mark, picking up where we left off last week. So as you remember, we had the account of Jesus gathering his disciples, equipping them and sending them out in pairs to do ministry, and they were successful. And then we had the account of the retelling of the beheading of John the Baptist, a reminder to the early disciples that following the will of God, that putting yourself out there as a representative of what God wants in the world, even though that's good, may still result in people hating you and persecuting you and even executing you. So between these stories of success and the reminder of the hardship that can come from being a disciple, we now have the account of Jesus performing a miracle. So Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. 
So the disciples went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus began teaching them many things. By this time, it was already late in the day, so his disciples came to Jesus. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Go and see. When the disciples found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. Jesus also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five so this is a familiar story, a familiar account of the feeding of the 5,000. Now before we get too focused on that number, the very last verse of this passage tells us there were 5,000 men who were fed. Now if you all took out your Greek lexicon and looked up that word for men there, it means heads of household. So it means 5,000 in the crowd were considered head of household. In addition to their wives, their children, their servants, the tagalongs, the widows, the unmarried, the orphaned. So there are probably not 5,000 people in this crowd, but quite easily 20 to 30,000 people in this crowd. So it's amazing, first of all, to think of that many people spontaneously arriving in one place at the same time for one purpose when it was unannounced. So the passage begins by telling us that Jesus was with his disciples. They had just come back from this extraordinary evangelical missionary outing where Jesus equipped them and said, go out, don't take anything with you, go in pairs, do something amazing, and they did. Scripture tells us they exercised demons, they healed people, they prayed, they taught, they came back to Jesus with this report that we were successful. You equipped us and taught us and we went out and did things in your name and people's lives are better for it. They came back satisfied and happy, but hungry and exhausted. The work of missionary outlet, the work of putting all that out, all into the people, depleted them. And so they are physically hungry, they are physically exhausted, but they're also spiritually kind of on a, a low point, like the low battery on their phone has come on. They're on low battery mode, and they need rest. They need Sabbath. And Jesus recognizes that. He said, great, let's take some time to recover. So we are going to travel together and take the day off. We'll get in the boat. We'll go across the river, across the, the body of water. We'll go to the other side, away from all the people you just interacted with, and rest. For anyone who is extroverted, sometimes you get energy off of being with other people. But it's apparent for the disciples, maybe some of them are more introverted, and all of this putting out of personality, effort, spiritual engagement had physically depleted them. And they need not only to eat and sleep, but kind of to be somewhere quiet, kind of low sensory, not a lot of distractions, a lot of things in their faces. And so they find some time just to rest. And for anyone who knows rest is on the horizon, you look forward to it. I know I find myself doing this, looking at my calendar and being like, well, today's busy, but on Wednesday I'll get to sit down. That'll be nice when Wednesday gets here. I have like this pocket of three hours with nothing on the calendar, and hopefully no one sabotages that. 
and you're able to have enough energy to move forward because you know eventually there's this promise of rest or this promise of renewal or this promise of connecting with something you enjoy that will then kind of fill up your energy banks again. So when the disciples step into this boat, it's with this hopefulness that by the time the get boat gets to the other side of the water, we will be alone, it'll be quiet, we can put our feet up, have a sandwich and a drink and relax. And that all gets sabotaged. As they're journeying across the water, the word has gotten out that Jesus is traveling and then he's with his disciples. And now the gossip is about more than just Jesus. Jesus has done fantastic things. He has been preaching and teaching and performing miracles. He, in and of himself, has become a local celebrity that people seek out, that people follow, that people want to be around. So yes, there's people running around the lake shore to the other side because they know Jesus will be there. But also, we're right on the cusp, right on the back end of the disciples going out in the name of Jesus performing miracles and teaching and being successful in ministry. So now the gossip is broader than simply Jesus, the mentor, the prophet, the rabbi, the teacher will be there, but Jesus and these 12 who follow him who also supernaturally have been able to interact and heal and bring God's blessing to our community. So there's not just Jesus on the other side of this lake if we run around the lake shore. We're also going to find these 12 apprentices or students of Jesus who are also doing effective things in the name of God. So the word gets out, and people run around the lake to get to the other side quicker than the boat does to meet the boat. And again, we're talking maybe 30,000 people. This is not simply that the neighborhood kids heard the ice cream truck and five of them emerged from their houses. This is tens of thousands of people. Imagine being a disciple in that boat. You probably already have your eyes closed, you're leaning back. Oh, there's going to be a sandwich on the other end, a cold drink, and I get a rest. And you open your eyes, and there's 30,000 people at <laughs> you on the shore. It's daunting. It's overwhelming. It may not feel like a warm reception and a reward and good energy. It feels like, oh, there's more people on the other side. I, I thought I was going to my day off. And there's more work to do than even when I'm trying to recover. So it's understandable that when Jesus gets off this boat and his immediate response is to care and welcome the people and start preaching, that the disciples might be like, really? It's supposed to be our day off. <laughs> like, Jesus, tell the people to go home. <laughs> Everything inside them must be saying, we are tired, we are burdened, our bodies and souls are weary. You promised us a warm meal and a bed, and we're right back to work. Like, where is my day off? So you can understand how there's some indignation or resentment or weariness or a lack maybe of clear-headedness amongst these exhausted disciples who are not overjoyed to see the reception of this impromptu, spontaneous crowd to receive them, but instead probably a bit annoyed that they're there. And then Jesus goes right into preaching and teaching. So the people are gathered, the people are listening, if you watch the Chosen television series, they talk about how could Jesus project his voice? Was that a miracle in and of itself? And the fictional retelling of this, the embellishment that Hollywood has done, is that the disciples had to transmit the message. So the way that they've imagined this is Jesus preaches, and similar to having someone translate you, then kind of the disciples are stationed throughout the crowd and they're reverberating this message. So Jesus is saying, God loves you. And then 200 yards away, the other disciples are like, God loves you. And then, then God, loves you. the message is going through the crowd, so everyone hears it. So the disciples are not getting a day off at all. They are still working the crowd, mitigating the people, getting this message from Jesus that he's teaching throughout this entire crowd. And the people are excited to be there. But the disciples haven't eaten, the disciples are exhausted. They were expecting a day off, they've lost that opportunity. Now, hours have passed, and again, the spontaneous group of people who came just because they heard that Jesus and his disciples would be there have come, so none of them packed a lunch. They didn't know they were going to be gone all day. They just happened to be out and about and heard and followed this throng of people to the other side of the lake, and nobody packed their lunchbox. So nobody has any food, and hours now have passed. So finally, Jesus pauses and responds and acknowledges the fact that people are hungry, 
The disciples' suggestion is, well, let's send people out to the countryside. You know, they had to walk a little bit because we came into a deserted place. You know, remember, Jesus, this was supposed to be our day off. We went to a quiet place, kind of tucked away so no one would find us. So we're not in the center of town where the corner store is to feed these people. You have to send them back to civilization for them to have something to eat. And Jesus' response is, no, let's just feed them what we have. Well, we don't have much, right? Because the disciples acknowledged they didn't have any food. They thought Jesus, when they got to the other end, was going to make them dinner. They hadn't really thought maybe that he didn't have any supplies. They kind of scrounge around and find that they have five loaves of bread and two fish. So do the math. There's 30,000 people. Probably not enough food. And Jesus asked the disciples to tell the people to sit down, and scripture is very specific, sit down in the green grass. Sit down in the lush creation of God. It's pretty amazing in a miracle of itself that you could ask 30,000 people to sit down and they would. <laughs> and not only sit down, but the word used is recline, basically like lounge in the grass. Like you were gonna go to an afternoon concert with your picnic blanket, and sit out in the nice, comfortable weather. Tell everyone to just lay down. Which is basically Jesus saying, I got this. Don't send the people away. You've already complained that if I send them away, no one's really far to get any food. You complain that it's too expensive for us to buy anything for them. They point out it's eight month wages to try to feed this many people. I would say that's probably a conservative estimate of feeding 30,000 people on a person's eight months of wages, unless maybe you're Elon Musk and have that much money. But this is a untenable, unsustainable reality. There's no way these 12 disciples plus their teacher, these 13 men, are gonna be able to feed and satisfy 30,000 people with the meager resources they have. But Jesus is relaxed, he is confident. Tell the people to lay down, we will take him. Then he says that scripture tells us he looks to heaven, he gives thanks to God, he blesses and breaks the food, the bread and the fish, and he starts passing it out. And he asks the disciples to help him in this process of passing it out. And as they kind of work the crowd, you can imagine time is passing, and these are hungry people. These are people who've been sitting for hours listening to this teacher teach. They themselves are hungry, the disciples who are passing out the food, they were promised a meal hours ago when some had been fed. So one would assume along the way they might be putting some in their own mouth <laughs> as they pass this food out because they're starving. And somehow when we're done and tens of thousands of people have been fed, the disciples come back to Jesus with 12 baskets overflowing with the leftovers, more than they started with which points to this miraculous nature of this feeding. In addition to the abundance of food, it's probably pretty miraculous that everyone was satisfied with bread and fish. You know, no one's complaining, where's the ketchup? You know, where's the lemonade? Where's the rest of us? No one is having any kind of grimace on their face or negative response. So the disciples are affirmed, this is a very hospitable crowd that they are feeding. They are well behaved, they wait their turn, no one ran up to the front to greedily be fed first. This group of intermixed people from all different corners of society have been fed, have been satisfied, and miraculously, there's 12 baskets of leftovers. And the disciples get to eat too, thankfully. They didn't even get the rest in the afternoon nap they were promised, but they get a meal. So we wonder why. Why this miracle? Why is this story told? Why is this lifted up? It's probably one of the most famous miracles in scripture. But the question is, is it truly one of the most impressive miracles? Is raising someone from the dead more impressive than making some bread? <laughs> probably. Is healing someone who's been sick for 12 years more impressive than sharing fish? Probably. If I had to gauge miracles, although I cannot do this and it is supernatural, and it's amazing. It may not be as impressive as healing people, restoring sight, restoring someone who's paralyzed, able to walk, having someone rise from the dead. 
But this story, the feeding of the 5,000, tends to be a miracle that we retell in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and our own testimony quite often, maybe more so even than the raising of Lazarus or the healing of a paralytic or any other account of the supernatural intervention of God through Jesus Christ. There's some sort of comfort in this account. And many theologians and Bible commentators who over the centuries have read and taught this have noticed that, not just for us as modern Americans, but across the world, this tends to be a favorite miracle story. It tends to be one that we tell and retell and have a comfort in sharing more so than some other accounts of miracles through the ministry of Christ. And the question is, where is that comfort? And many people who spend a lot more time studying this than I have make commentary and comment about the fact that this miraculous story touches on a lot of things in the foundational faith of the Jewish people. One of the first things that God did in scripture was provide for the sustenance of creation. In the creation story, the blessing of the goodness of the Garden of Eden is that there is so much food just abundantly growing that you don't need to worry about eating. Your daily needs are provided for. That Adam and Eve had everything they needed to basically be fat and naked and happy. They screwed that up. <laughs> they gave it to temptation. They betray God and betray themselves. And they sin. But before they give in that temptation, God has provided an abundance so that they never have to worry about daily provisions. Part of the goodness of God is that you have an abundance and your daily needs are taken care of. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Take care of my daily bread. That's a request that we have. That we expect God can take care of our daily needs and that's a point of blessing and expectation in our relationship with God when it's a good relationship, when we are in right relationship with God. So the people gathered on that field, reclining in the green grass, they know that God's good intention at the moment of creation, before sin entered, was that you would have enough to eat, that you'd be satisfied and happy, that food would not be a daily ordeal in your life or concern. It's only when sin enters that the scarcity of that enters into our life as a daily working thing, that providing for food is something that distracts us from the rest of life. It's a necessary task now. Later on in God's relationship with God's people, they're wandering in the wilderness Moses is leading them, and what's the gripe the people have? You took us away from our food. Yes, we're free. Yes, we can now worship openly. Yes, we don't have taskmasters threatening to beat us or kill us. But you know what? I don't have any food. I don't have any water. And God provides. God provides manna from heaven, this bread that supernaturally appears every day and appears in a twofold way so that on the Sabbath you don't have to go gather it. God provides quail so we have meat. God provides water out of a rock so we don't thirst. God takes care of the provisions for God's people. And then when David, great psalmist, is writing liturgy and poetry for the church, when he doesn't even know that generations later you and I will be sitting here using his words as part of our devotional life, he's writing for those who worship the one true God, and he writes the 23rd Psalm. It speaks about how God, our shepherd, will have me lie down in green grass and provide for my daily needs. And Jesus turns to the disciples and says, have these people lie down in the green grass and I will provide what they need because I am their good shepherd. Time and time again, Jesus is living into the prophecies and promises of scripture, allowing people to recount what God has done, and what God promises to continue to do. The prophet Ezekiel has spoke about the people of Israel being like people who were lost sheep without a shepherd. And this amazing promise that Ezekiel offers that God will one day provide a shepherd who will tend to the people, keep them safe, provide for them, give them abundance in times of scarcity, give them safety in times of danger, ensure that they know who God is and that God is their God. And that God will provide, the prophet promises, this amazing leader in the line of God's people who will rise up to be the shepherd and guide those people. And that Jesus stands in front of this crowd and says, I got this. 
I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. You are safe in this place. It is peaceful. Listen and learn from me. Then lie down in this green grass and enjoy an abundant meal that more than satisfies your needs. Be safe and content in my presence. He's not just teaching that to his 12 disciples who are kind of exhausted out of the ministry they've done. He's not just affirming to them that, yes, I did promise you a meal and here it is. He's teaching this greater lesson that I'm providing it for all God's children, all those who are eager to be in the presence of God and one another. And like a good shepherd, I'm protecting them with peace and security as we gather here. As the psalmist reminds us, we're going to lie down in green grass as the shepherd provides for us. As Moses, as the mouthpiece of God, provided the manna and the quail and the water and the wilderness, Jesus says, now my disciples are going to provide to you an abundance of food. And it will be as if the goodness that God intended is restored in this moment. It's not restored forever. But in this moment of common faith and witness and gathering, in this impromptu, basically, tent revival on a hillside, we are going to have not only the word of God, the protection and peace and fellowship of being with fellow believers, but we will have the very physical things we need to be sustained. And if you want to keep reading into all the clues and all the affirmations and all the commitments that God makes through this one miraculous story, in the end, it's no mistake that there are 12 baskets left over of food. The number 12 comes over and over again in Scripture. There are 12 tribes of Israel. There are now 12 disciples. This example of wholeness, of sustainability, of providence, of preparation, that God has some sort of plan for God's people. And not only does the Gospel of Mark bring to our attention that there's 12 baskets left over, but it would not have been lost on the people gathered there that there's something left over. And I'm sure, I know I would have, I would have counted how much was left over. <laughs> I would have been quite impressed that not only was something left over, but 12 baskets full left over. And you can imagine kind of the gossip, the good chit chat that spreads through that crowd of tens of thousands of people as they not only say, we arrived without an invitation to an impromptu event and we were not told to go home or go away. Jesus, who obviously should be exhausted, and his disciples, who should be exhausted, did not tell us to go home and it was their day off. They stayed, they preached, they teach, they took care of us. And we have noticed that those gathered around us cooperated, were obedient, were good listeners, and then when the time came to eat, to eat together, we sat down and we waited our turn. We enjoyed fellowship together. And in the abundant mercy of God and the miraculous thing that has happened here, there is leftovers. And not just a little bit of crumbs, there is more than we started with. Jesus has testified to this amazing abundance of God's provision. The Gospel of Mark is purposeful in ensuring that this abundant, miraculous story is told at this point in the narrative of the instruction of the disciples. They have gone out and performed miraculous wonders, but they've realized they needed to come back to Jesus to be replenished. They have gone out and testified to what God can do to those who are faithful, and the word got out in a way that tens of thousands of people responded to see and hear it for themselves. They know that the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, was assassinated, was beheaded, was punished, for preparing the way for Jesus. And they're not going to squander that sacrifice. They're not going to let that death be in vain. They are now going to continue to testify not only to what God is doing in Jesus Christ, but to the abundance that God has for the world. The powers and principalities cannot shut them up or quiet them or make them feel less than that God's abundance will triumph and there will be enough for everyone to be sustained and provided for, to be at peace, and to be able to acknowledge that Jesus is fulfilling this promise of being the good shepherd. Now, if you want to read the footnotes in every commentary and every theological reflection offered on this passage, there are more than the four or five examples I've offered to you 
of connections people make to the rest of Scripture, to the prophecy about Jesus Christ, to the promises of who God would be in the Messiah, to God's people. I would encourage you to take this passage of Scripture, to go back and read the Gospel of Mark, to look at this very familiar account that's often titled The Feeding of the 5,000, and to read it yourself again, and to look at maybe what footnotes or lessons are offered in whatever study Bible you may use. To not let yourself dive too far down the Google rabbit hole, but if you Google it, look at the first two or three results of what kind of commentaries are offered from different backgrounds, from not only fellow Christians, but those who look at scripture from the point of view of historians or as messianic Jews, or from other perspectives around the world and other cultures. How is this lesson, this miraculous offering of scripture using communities who feed those who are hungry, who shepherd those who feel aimless and lost. How many food banks turn to this passage of scripture in their mission and vision statement to the world, to their donors, to explain why they are feeding people who are hungry and in need of a meal. When people are in need of rest and peace and they open up scripture or they open up the words of scripture on their heart and go to the 23rd Psalm and are able to retell those words for themselves when they need solace and a reminder that God will provide for them. Do you say the 23rd Psalm and find yourself fed? Does lying down in a green pasture while the shepherd guards you with his rod and his staff, does that bring you comfort? Have you ever felt a connection between the feeding and abundance at creation the feeding in abundance during the wilderness journey under Moses. The feeding in abundance in this field, on this hillside by a lake. When the Holy Spirit guides us and generations of people to make connections between prophecy and promise and testimony and scripture, what a gift it is that we have the hindsight to do it. Those living those moments did not realize the impact of those moments on the rest of not only world history, but on theology and faith practice. Those being fed on that hillside by the lake that day did not come expecting a meal or even a lesson. They basically came to be able to say, I, I saw a celebrity today. <laughs> I was in the presence of Jesus and his disciples to be able to go home with a story to tell their neighbors. What they were doing was the equivalent of today when you happen to be out and about and brush elbows with someone important and you take a selfie to prove, like, hey, I was in the grocery store and so was the mayor. I was in the grocery store and so was so-and-so. You know, someone famous was in my sphere. That's all they expect. Then they got hours of teaching that isn't recorded in scripture. We have no idea what Jesus taught about that day. We have no idea what his lesson was. That has been lost to history. We know that his disciples heard it and this impromptu crowd heard it. We know that he spoke for hours and yet the people stayed. The people who were already probably out of breath, hungry and sweaty from running around that lake, unprepared, were willing to sit and listen for hours. It was that good, whatever they were absorbing from his teaching. And then as they shared that meal, I would imagine they're kind of debriefing what they've heard. As you or I would chit chat over a meal, they've witnessed and heard this amazing teaching for hours, and now they're having all these side by conversations, not only about the miracle that there's enough bread and fish to go around, but did you hear what Jesus said? Do you realize his disciples, they've been in our community and they, they healed my neighbor. I heard that they worked a miracle. Have you heard about the things Jesus taught and did in other communities before he got here? Questions around this gathering in the grass of, of where do you think he's going next? What could he do next? What does it mean that there's this holy man and he's doing and saying these things? What's going to happen tomorrow? What could he do to outdo this? What is the next big thing? And then the testimony they're going to have when they leave that field, when they leave that green grass, and they have found rest and shelter and peace and comfort and they have been well fed, and then they go home with a story to tell. And I'm imagining if they go home with that story, they're going to have to travel pretty far to tell someone else the story. Because everyone within walking distance is there. 
<laughs> if every single person, 30,000 of us, who could have walked are there, we're going to have to journey farther to tell this story to someone who wasn't a witness to it, to someone who hasn't heard it yet, to someone who didn't experience it. Because the whole neighborhood showed up. So we need to go beyond the bounds of our comfort zone, of our neighbors, of the people we usually share with, and be vulnerable with this account, with this miraculous testimony, and tell it to people who maybe live and believe and exist a little bit differently than we do, beyond the bounds of our normal circle, and share this amazing testimony. So as you maybe take the time this week to reread these dozen or so verses, to look at this and reflect <clears throat> upon what maybe hit you differently today, what I shared or what the Spirit said to you that I may not have shared, and then how might you share that story with someone outside your usual circle? Someone who you don't usually break bread with, someone who you don't usually see at the mailbox or out walking their dog, someone beyond your usual neighborhood. How could this story, this miraculous account, how could that be shared with someone outside your usual sphere of influence and connection? And are you willing to be confident enough as well as vulnerable enough to faithfully share this miraculous account with someone beyond the bounds of your usual circle? Amen. abundance of God, for the provisions that God has had over generations to take care of all of God's people, even when they grumble and complain, even when it's unexpected. We are grateful for the ways God has used the outpouring of abundance and generosity in our congregation so that we can respond to expected things like facilities concerns and personnel things and things that are usually in our budget, but also that we can respond with abundance to needs that come unexpectedly or for occasional mission adventures or for ways that we respond to endeavors and entrepreneurship and good ideas that come out of our ministry. So we'd be grateful not only that we can joyfully give when it's kind of the everyday commitment of the church, the everyday work and testimony, but also on these opportunities to respond out of abundance to special responses, to ensure that we never have to say no when God stirs us to respond. So thank you for your continued good stewardship and generosity, for your joyful giving, but also for your openness the leading of the Spirit so that we can, in new ways, show forth the love and grace and hospitality of God to anyone who may reach out to us in need. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that throughout Scripture, you tell us that you are a God of abundance, a God of provision, a God who provides our daily bread and more. We thank you, Lord. That if we are to mimic your behavior, to be the hands and feet and face of Christ to the world, that we are called to be like you. To provide more than enough. To bless others when they don't even expect it. We thank you, Lord, for what you have given us. And we ask that you guide us to use all that we have through the ministry of this church in our daily lives. So that others may see the goodness, the provision, and the abundance of God the amazing love and witness of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I invite you to lift your voice with me as we sing the hymn, Be Still and Know. Oh. 
Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we have so much to be thankful for. We celebrate guests in worship this morning. We celebrate members who are traveling and exploring your beautiful creation. We celebrate upcoming birthdays. We give thanks for transitions and jobs and new opportunities. But Lord, we also lift up to you and pray that in moments of birthdays and anniversaries and celebrations and traveling, we also remember that there are those who are mourning those who are in need of healing, those who feel alone, those who feel that there's scarcity rather than abundance. So Lord, in this world that seems paradoxical and full of contradictions and extremes, we ask, Lord, that we find peace, that we find a middle way, that we find a way to be empathetic and grace-filled, to offer out of your abundance so that everyone may feel filled and recognized, loved and known by you. Lord, we thank you for communities of faith like this one that support one another. And we lift up our greater world, communities that are in conflict, communities that are divisive, those who are at war, those who feel trapped and in places of danger. And we ask, Lord, 
that we be able to share out of our place of welcome and Sabbath and peace and be able to testify to your love and welcome so that everyone, even in times of struggle, can know the Lord is with them. We thank you for testimony from scripture and we thank you for testimony from our own daily lives. We ask that through your Holy Spirit you give us the convictions, the affirmation, the energy to share with others, to be vulnerable about our own faith and to witness to the ways the love of Christ and the everlasting presence of your spirit sustains us. We thank you, Lord, that this day and always you hear and receive our prayers and you identify us as your disciples who you've taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you as we continue in a spirit of praise and thanksgiving to stand with me if you're able and raise your voices for Break Thou the Bread of Life as our closing hymn. distract us from opportunities to respond with faith, love, and grace when the opportunity presents itself. A God who has taught us that Jesus is our good shepherd, and a God who reminds us that when we are hungry and thirsty and tired, we only need to come before him, and he will provide. Go now with the blessings of God our creator, Jesus our shepherd, and the knowledge of the ever-comforting, ever-present Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.